This is The Meaningful Way. I'm your host, Luke Iorio. You know, there's times on on this show that we reflect on and hear stories about how much can change in just a single moment. When those types of occurrences, those types of experiences uh, show up for us, we reflect on what matters most. We get in touch with how we really want to live our lives. And we share these stories on this podcast from time to time for a few different reasons. One is to help you make sense of whatever the tough times or the challenges are that you might be going through. And to hopefully prompt a shift for you to get you in touch with something without you needing to go through an experience that might be very challenging or even traumatic. And so with that in mind, I get to welcome today's guest, Dr. Richard Schuster. He is a licensed clinical psychologist and the host of The Daily Helping, which is a podcast regularly downloaded in over 35 countries. On his show, Dr. Schuster's guests educate and inspire listeners through their stories, expertise, and passion for helping make a difference in the lives of others. You probably have a sense of why I'm bringing him on here. (laughs) His mission is to help people become the best version of themselves and as a consequence, make the world a better place. When he's not in the studio recording new episodes of the Daily Helping Podcast, he's in the office where he conducts forensic and neuropsychological assessments for children and adults. He's a sought-after media expert, and Dr. Schuster's clinical expertise and podcasts have been featured in such publications as the Huffington Post, NBCNews.com, Glassdoor.com, Reader's Digest, and others. And with that, Dr. Schuster, I want to thank you for coming on The Meaningful Way. I'm really happy to be here, Luke. Thank you so much. Thanks. The uh, Let's begin here, because there is a portion, a major portion, of your bio that I intentionally left out, uh, because that is going to be a big part of the focus for our conversation today. So let me set the stage, uh, as it were, for everybody. Uh, about 16 years ago, you're out of college, you're working in the, the technology sector for many years, and in your last role in that field, you even served as the executive director for an IT consulting firm, where you had clients like the U.S. Army, state agencies, Fortune 500 companies. It was truly the kind of that that beautiful career arc that so many of us come out of college and, and look for for ourselves. And at that moment, you're beginning to think, wow, this is this is what I wanted. This is what I've been working for. What happens then? You're absolutely right, Luke. I went to college, got out and started climbing that ladder, so to speak. And along the way, on what seemed like any other Saturday, I was driving to have dinner with my cousin, and I was in a horrific car accident to the degree that I broke my back, suffered a number of internal injuries, uh, and it was kind of miraculous that I even survived it. What happened was I was making a left-hand turn. I was at the base of a hill. It was like 5 o'clock on a Saturday in the fall, so that sun was dead in my eyes and I couldn't see the silver car, you know, the way the sun reflected off that car was almost like it cloaked it, so to speak. Uh, I'm not saying it wasn't my fault. I got the ticket and should have, but um, thank God the other driver is okay. But as I'm casually turning left, he slams into me full speed and and T-bones me, which sent me careening into oncoming traffic in the other direction. My airbag had already deployed. Mm. And what saved my life was that my car's momentum was stopped by uh, smashing into a telephone pole. And had the telephone pole hit me just a little bit, maybe like half a foot further down towards my door, that probably would have killed me too. But it was one of those things where, you know, go to the hospital and, you know, they they come and they put up the x-ray and you, you get mm-hmm. to see, oh, here's your spine. I'm like, oh, fantastic. But what was really powerful about that was the brain is so interesting. And there's been quite a bit of research done on near-death experiences in the brain and mm-hmm. our perception of time as it relates to that. There's a, a gentleman, I believe he's out of Stanford, his name is David Eagleman, who's done quite a bit of research on this. He's a neuroscientist. And what a common phenomenon is, is that when people perceive themselves as essentially about to die, which I most certainly did, uh, time slows down remarkably. Mm-hmm. So the entire accident maybe. Two seconds, maybe Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. two seconds, but I'm able to have these really kind of in-depth conversations with myself about, 
all right, I'm going to die right now. And then my first thoughts, you know, I wasn't married at the time, but my first thoughts were with my, my mom and dad. Like, when they get that phone call, what are they going to think? Uh, what kind of life did I, have I led to that point? Um, am I, I was so focused on all of the wrong things. I was focused on money. I was focused on things, fancy cars and boats and things I didn't. And there's nothing wrong with cars or boats, but yeah. my, my reason for wanting them was just so... It was for the purpose of just having these yeah. things. And so I, I just, you know, it wasn't more like I was making a bargain with, with God or anything saying, hey, if I get out of this, like uh, like Scrooge, you know, <laughs> I, I'm going to, you know, be a nicer person. It was like, wow, I really have not led a great life. I, in mm. fact, the life I've led has kind of sucked from an altruistic standpoint. And then I, I convalesced. I, mm-hmm. I survived, obviously. I uh, a lot of therapy, you know, physical therapy and all of the things to to get my range of motion back and, and everything else. And I did go back to work. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like everything was gray, you know, where every, you know, like it, it, the analogy kind of like Neo after he's figured out like the Matrix is this fake simulation. Like I just didn't mm. feel like I belonged there anymore. And I was miserable. Like I was, and I worked there. Even even despite that, I stuck it out for a couple of years longer than I probably should have. Uh, one because I was afraid to make that change, even though I knew down deep that I wasn't doing really what I was put on this earth to do. But I needed something different. I needed mm-hmm. to make a change in my life, and and I went. I walked away from it. I walked away from that business, and. That caused a lot of pain because there were a lot of expectations put on me, not only by myself, but on, but on others. Uh, I know that I let people down initially when I did that, hmm. and that was something that I just had to come to terms with. But essentially go from a 70 to 80 hour a week endeavor to zero. Yeah. And I had no idea, no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life whatsoever. Um, <laughs> so what, <laughs> the, the, what ended up happening, which was pretty wild, was... I went to a grocery store and overheard a couple women talking. Hey, what's this MySpace business? My son's <laughs> on MySpace. My daughter's on MySpace. And yeah, I mean, I've got this background in technology and, and I know some of these things. So I said, hey, you know, I didn't mean to butt in, but, you know, it's X, Y, and Z. And they're like, oh, well, you, you kind of seem to know a lot about this stuff. And and we're on the PTA at this school. And, uh, long, and so then they had me just come out and, and I gave a little speech on internet safety. Mm-hmm. And there happened to be uh, a guy in the audience whose son went to that school and he was on a member of that city's cybercrime division for their police department. So mm. we struck up a conversation before I know it. Now I'm going around doing that sort of thing. I'm using my knowledge and technology in a different way, helping yeah. people. Yeah. And that was very cool. So this was all kind of pre-iPhone. So it was a very different discussion than mm-hmm. I would have with parents today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I started doing that. And then at one of these schools, I was asked by a counselor essentially saying, hey, you know, we've got this mentor program. We've got lots of females, but we don't have any males. Mm-hmm. And we have male students. And I said, yeah, I can do that. Mm-hmm. So I started mentoring a kid. And it wasn't therapy, of course, but... Mm-hmm. It was really cool to be a part of watching this kid change his disposition a bit and, and right. change some things in his life. And, and I'm not going to be arrogant and say, oh, you know, because he met with me, everything changed. No, no, no. He, he did it. But I had a hand in it. Mm-hmm. And I was part of that transformation for him. And I was like, well, that feels really good. And uh, so the next thing I know, I'm applying to graduate schools, and and that's really what put me on the path that I'm on today. So, you know, unexpected, uh, a a conversation, and then having, I guess, the intrusiveness, if you will, to butt in, but it it shifted the course of my life, for sure. Well, let me ask you a little bit further about that, because you described, and I'm really interested in the way that you described this, and, and, and it was very briefly, but I want to come back to it, was that you talk about, you know, prior uh, things like career advancement, the the money, the toys that come with money and things like that were, were part of what was important. Uh, and then it no longer has that same level of importance. And you described it as you were then in this kind of gray area. You were in this like gray phase. And I'm curious, when, when you're not yet sure of 
really what's the direction you want to go in? What really is the, the meaning that you're supposed to drive from this? How do you navigate that, that gray time, that space in between, as it were? If you're fortunate, you have a, a guide, a mentor, somebody to help you through that. I did not, um, in part because I kept a lot of this to myself. Yeah. And in, in other parts, because the people who I was surrounded with, these were people I were working with, I knew at some point were probably not going to be in my life anymore. I mm -hmm. think for me, like I said, I spent far longer than I needed to mm -hmm. making myself miserable because I lacked the courage mm. to make that change. And I think that we will do, and this is not just in our careers, this is in relationships, this is in everything, that we will find any way we can to justify situations. And a lot of times it's to avoid pain. Yeah. And a lot of times it's because of fear of the unknown. And yeah. what we know about fear is that the fear is often much worse than what the, rea the real situation would be. Mm -hmm. So I would say to be true to yourself. And when you start hearing that little voice inside of you saying, yeah, this, this is probably not right for me. I, I'm a big fan of journaling. I do it in my morning routine mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one way. It's not the only way, but that's a good way to start getting down on paper your thoughts. Because what starts happening is when you go back and look at two weeks back, three weeks back, six weeks back, you'll see patterns and yeah. you'll see messages that kind of come through that are consistent themes. And from there, you could say, oh, okay, well, here's here it is, loud and clear. I'm seeing it. These are my own thoughts and words and writing. That's helpful, to, I think, to push people in the directions they need to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it's interesting because I, I hear that as a best practice from a lot of uh, the, the guests and experts that come on this show is that idea of a morning journal. Uh, I know it's something for me. I you know was introduced to even the idea of it with Julia Cameron and the artist way, however many years ago it was. Uh, and it is exactly as you describe. It's amazing what a you end up writing that you didn't even know was fully in your head until it's all of a sudden on paper. Uh, but then to be able to go back and reflect on what are the patterns, what are the trends, what's really being revealed here over a course of time. Uh, it's amazing what jumps off the page at that point. Uh, if you could speak a little bit more, because what I, I you described, uh, you know, going through some of this shift, and I'll, I'll kind of use different words for it, that you can't put the blinders back on, meaning that you knew things needed to be different. You knew that they needed to go in this different way, and you get into this place where you are afraid to make the change. You're starting to go through and kind of investigate where this may be, but people have this tendency. It's almost as if we need to, you know, stay within a situation and stack up the misery long enough before we're finally ready to say, okay, fine. It's now really painful. Now I'll change. And so I'm just curious, you know, you, you talk about some of the processes, but what is it that you think people can find a way of beginning to tap into earlier so they don't need to wait for that pain or some traumatic experience like what, what you went through that ultimately led to this? I think one of the things that happens when we start doing this emotional reasoning, this bargaining, if you will, is we look at what we've put into it. So if it's a relationship, it's probably time. Well, with businesses, it can be time too. And in, in my case, it was time and money. Mm -hmm. So there's always this little voice. You know, I, I always love those old cartoons with the angel and the devil on the shoulder. Yeah. Maybe that was actually, uh, I think, the movie animal house now that right. i think about it. But, uh you know the the one voice the let's fix it voice is always going to say well you've put this much time and effort into it that's i think that for a lot of people is like well it's hard to cut your losses because you've invested yeah. so much in whatever it is you've invested so much and what i would encourage people to do is think about what is the long-term cost? Forget how much, how many months or years you've been in a relationship. Think about it in terms of, do I really want to spend the rest of my life mm. in X situation, mm. which I know, whether I want to admit it to myself or others or not, is not in my best interest to do so. Mm -hmm. That's And that's important. 
that certainly is going to anchor it in a little more deeply to, to think about, do I really want to spend the rest of my life in this moment, in this experience, in, in this relationship or this job? Uh, and when you feel that, if there, you know, is there that much pain that, that is actually underneath there, that certainly is going to well it up uh, for you to be able to acknowledge what's there. So if we do, if we do begin to acknowledge, okay, this is not for me, I recognize I do want to make this shift and I do want to make this change, but I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm staring this uncertainty in the face and I just don't know where to go. How do they begin to figure out that path? How do they begin to investigate in such a way that they can make some choices that they can feel a little bit more confident in? I think for me, what pushed me on my path and, and my circumstances today are very different than they were then. In a then, I was single. Then I didn't have children, you know, so my responsibilities mm -hmm. were different where I could just burn the ships mm -hmm. and I did and then figure it out later. But the other piece that was really driving for me, and, and I think this would be so for your listeners as well, is I knew that what I was doing wasn't in alignment with what I was supposed to be doing. Mm. I felt like after that accident that I needed to find a way to help others. And that I wasn't helping others in the role that I was. Yeah. So everybody has different strengths and abilities. So I think when you find your sweet spot, that is, what are you really, really good at? How does what you're really good at connect with your core values? Mm -hmm. And if you can find something you're great at that is in alignment with your values that is helpful and makes the world a better place, and you find a way to generate a living doing that, that's it. Yeah. That's the grand slam home run right there. Yeah, absolutely. So for everybody, again, what, what you are good at, what you're great at, knowing what those gifts, those talents are, aligning those with your values and how do those correlate? How do those play off of one another? How is it that you can use, tie the values and what you're good at to helping others and then something that, that people are obviously willing to pay for. That is an extraordinary sweet spot and a, a great way of being able to start to approach it and investigate it. Uh, and I also like the fact that, you know, when you described, well, you're coming through this gray area, there was a curiosity there. There was a curiosity of, you know, something led you to, to jump into that conversation about MySpace. Uh, there was a curiosity of, sure, I'll, why not? I'll take on that mentoring. And so you were willing to explore and, and try a few things out and try a few things on. And that is, sounds like what ultimately led you to say, yeah, I'm onto something. For sure. Because essentially, I went from a, a place of having no idea what I was supposed to be doing with my life to, yeah, this is it. And if yeah. I can make money doing this, oh my God, how awesome. So <laughs> I, I think that we have to have the courage to explore opportunities that are put in front of us. You know, it's it's... Mm -hmm. No different than, you know, when we're essentially courting somebody for a relationship. You know, it's, it's the the girl that lives in your apartment complex and you ride the elevator the same day getting to your cars every morning <laughs> when you're leaving for the office. And you finally muster that courage to, you know, actually look her in the eye and talk to her. Now, obviously different than my situation, but again, there's opportunities in front of us every day. Absolutely. But if we don't act on them, they're wasted. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, it just, what, what, now, would I have probably one way or the other found my way into graduate school? Probably, I would guess, but I'm really glad how it happened because sure. along the way, it, it let me help a lot of other kids and provide an impact in a totally unexpected way. Actually, go a little further into that because what, what was it uh, with, you know, specifically, there's a lot of ways to, to, to help people, okay? But there was something about psychology specifically that drew you in. What, what was it? What was it that said, yeah, this is, this is completely tuned into who I am? If I go back to when I was 17 and we were forced to take these aptitude tests in high school that our guidance counselor said, what should we be? My, my scoring said I should be a psychologist or therapist or something along those lines. And yet all I ever <laughs> wanted to do was be a talk show host. So I guess now I'm, I'm both. There you go. You got both. <laughs> which is pretty wild. <laughs> uh, and it, but I think most people in the helping profession, whether they're marriage therapists or psychologists or doctors of other kinds, whatever they are, they all kind of have this common thread where it just feels good to help others. Now, there's a neuroscience behind that that I mm -hmm. could talk about, but yeah, I would always, it was weird, like, growing up my whole life, people would come, 
you know, servicemen would come to the house to fix our air conditioning unit, people would just open up to me. People would just start saying, yeah, I, I don't know you and I don't know why I'm telling you this, but X, Y, and Z is going on in my life. And I guess whatever either my listening or I had to say back to them was helpful. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's just kind of something that's always been there. Mm -hmm. I, I've always been, you know, the friend that when things are going horribly wrong that people would come to and say, well, you know, can I share this with you? And I would always say, of course. Um, so now the, the assessment piece, I had no clue. I liked that until many years later. But the mm -hmm. just the from an altruistic standpoint, I think that that was just always there. But then when I was becoming more clear in what I was going to do in a career, I was able to apply labels and in particular subsets of professional disciplines where I could use those skills and learn from some really smart people mm -hmm. how to put them into action in the community. Mm -hmm. Well, and actually, let's go off that a little bit because you mentioned that in the community and, and altruistically, and one of the experiences that you had uh, was that you had volunteered your time for crisis intervention during Hurricane Katrina. And I was curious if you could share some of the more meaningful experiences that, that, that you had and what it is that you saw and connected to while you were helping those that, that were suffering through that time. That was another really powerful experience for me, working with people who had been um, displaced from Hurricane Katrina. I was living in Texas at the time, so a lot of there was a lot of flow from Louisiana into Houston, San Antonio, and some other cities where people were essentially being bust and what really struck me as i look back on it was even we still we place such an emphasis on stuff hmm. homes cars toys whatever they are everybody who was there essentially lost everything they had ever owned hmm. gone everything gone clothes gone family heirlooms, wedding pictures, all of it, gone and gone forever. So it really made me focus on even more so, like, wow, like all that really matters is people and relationships because the rest mm -hmm. of it, replaceable. The rest of it doesn't really matter. Uh, the, the, the other thing that was striking to me, and this I experienced over – uh, weeks and months after Katrina because while I was training in graduate school, part of my training was working in a school system. So mm. I was actually working with children and their families. So what was wild about that was we had kids who would come in that maybe they had a learning disability or there were, for, forget about the actual trauma of everything that happened right. because they, that was there as an overlay on top of everything else they had going on in their lives. But there were no records. So we would, you know, the standard procedure is if you had a kid and the kid, you know, went to school, you're up in New Jersey. So, you mm -hmm. know, if you, if you relocated to another state and you had a kid and mm -hmm. those school records could be obtained and a yeah. baseline starting point for how we were going to provide treatment for a kid is there. Yeah. There's nothing for any of these kids. Everything was completely washed away and destroyed. So even in terms of how to start helping these kids, we didn't know yeah. because we had, and, and the system as is, the school systems are overwhelmed mm -hmm. and at capacity already with their normal caseload. So it was really wild in that sense and, and frustrating, frustrating mm -hmm. because there was at times, nothing you could do, at least not right away, to help getting these kids plugged in and getting them the help that they need. Yeah. What was what was maybe one of the the more inspirational experiences or, or you know, quote unquote, clients that you were able to work with at that time, where you know you remember whatever it is that you were able to to help them with, something turns around and you go, "Wow, this is this is why I'm here. This is what this is what I wanted to contribute to." It, there was a child that I worked with in an elementary school um, who had been a victim of abuse, and, and this was not a Hurricane Katrina mm -hmm. evacuee, but it was it was in that same time period. Mm -hmm. And what just struck with me was this child's resilience. That even though they had been through something absolutely horrific, here they were, sweet, loving, smiling. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it really, my take home from that was that no matter what happens to us, the good, the the best parts of humanity can still shine through. That was Mm. really, really cool to see. Mm. We're so much more than our our circumstances at at any given time, right? That's right. You know, there, there was one other thing I wanted to go back to that you said a moment ago, which was what you recognized as, you know, when, when we move past all the material and the possessions, everything else, the importance of people and relationships. And I was wondering if you could, you could share a little bit more, because I know that's certainly something that comes up on this show is how much uh, so many people want to develop those, those deeper connections, those deeper relationships. Uh, yet at the same time, for some reason, we seem to fumble around or we don't prioritize it or, or what have you. And I'm just kind of curious for your thoughts of, you know, how is it that, that we can go about forming these, these more impactful, these more meaningful relationships and connections within our lives? Turn off your phone <laughs> for what? Uh, <laughs> That's did, a good point right game. there. <laughs> but uh, honestly, I think if you look at where we're at as a society today, mm-hmm. There's a couple things that, that I notice, that I've noticed and, and have been concerned about for a while. Yeah. As you are, I'm sure, and many people, yeah. there was there was a promise. I, re- I remember, in fact, I was just talking about this with, with another one of my guests uh, on air, was that we were told 20 years ago that this amazing age of technology and automation is upon us. And it's going to be like the Jetsons and how easy our lives are going to be and we're going to work less and have more time to (laughs) spend with our friends and families. And in fact, the opposite has happened. Mm. So I think number one is make the time to connect with people. And I don't mean connect with them on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat. Mm. I mean, connect with them face to face and spend that time. The other piece to that would be, we are so focused on our work responsibilities. And Mm -hmm. uh, going back to my prior point, telework was supposed to usher in this era of, oh, no commute, and eh, it's amazing. But we know what the numbers show. We know that the research shows that those that telework actually work more hours than those that don't. Mm -hmm. And your employers know that too. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to discourage that (laughs) that trend from continuing, right? So, and I think this is especially true of entrepreneurs, yeah. Or and, and more so than, than that, solopreneurs. Because right. essentially what ends up happening is, I, I call it this the entrepreneurial lie, that there's always work to be done. You There's no lack of marketing that can be done by you. There's no lack of follow-up or if I just spend 20 more minutes on this project. Well, great. and But be aware if you're going to spend that extra 20 minutes at 7 o'clock at night working on a project. Yeah. That's 20 less minutes you get to spend with your significant other or your kid. Yeah. So for me, I I learned a great lesson when I was in my doctoral program by a resident when I was training at the Emory School of Medicine, when I, we, me and a couple of other students were kind of lamenting about the amount of work we had to do. And he just kind of calmly smiled and said, you know what? The work always gets done. Mm. And that has stuck with me because it's okay, you know, hope no cars Mm -hmm. crash when they're hearing this. It's shocking. It is okay (laughs) to shut your laptop and spend time with your kids. It's okay to say, I would rather watch a movie with my wife than, you know, put together a marketing slick or something like that. And I think Mm -hmm. we lose that because we get into this state of fear that says, if I'm not actively working on my business or I'm not, I, I'm not going to get more clients. I don't get more right. clients. Like it's like this perpetual cycle of craziness that we put ourselves into. Right. You know, it's funny because I've, I've followed uh, some of the, you know, some of the, the research and science has been coming out around productivity and, and obviously how engagement affects productivity and things like that. And I just use the example of, of where you're going right now is just, you know, picture for a moment when you're about to go on vacation, how much work, gets done in the 48 hours ahead of time so that you then have all of this time. When we work in, in, when we get, you know, tuned into the way in which we can work in bursts, our productivity can actually go through the roof, which then we, means we actually have more time. We just don't always know how to work in that manner. And to your point, when we close the laptop, we shut off the phone, we give ourselves less time to get certain things done, somehow they still get done. That's right. 
<laughs> so uh, I guess maybe, you know, if, if Richard, if we, we bring this around a little bit, because we've kind of gone back and forth on this in terms of what was before and what was the after in terms of some of your experiences and obviously the, the big accident that you'd had. And I guess maybe at this point, what is it that matters most to you in your life and work? So it's really two things. Family being one and fulfilling my mission of helping others become the best versions of who they are. Mm. So I'm really grateful because I get to do that in a couple ways in terms of the work. I get to do it on a micro level, working one-on-one with kids and adults for, from a clinical psychology standpoint. And I get to do it on a macro level, as you do mm-hmm. with a podcast. And they're very satisfying in different ways because mm-hmm. you see the direct results of you know, helping a kid that you've done a, a neuropsychological assessment for and, and helping put some things in place to right that kid's ship and help them you know, really become the best versions of who they're meant to be mm-hmm. versus you know, when you're doing the podcast, who knows? Like I, I know what the numbers are. I know, you know the thousands of people that this show reaches. I know, you know the countries that the sh- that people are downloading me in and all mm-hmm. of that. I, uh, I will probably never know what the the ramifications are in terms of how that helps people, as is the case with anybody that does a podcast. But I know it feels good, and that if one person out there benefits from it, I've done my job, and it's awesome. And you know, being able to have flexibility around that to spend the time with my wife and kids is priceless. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing when we we get so clear on you know what is that difference we want to make, uh, how is it that we want to go about doing it, we start to get very clear on how to shape our lives, how to create our schedules, how to prioritize the things that really matter most, and for those that have gone through the types of experiences and type of the the type of journey that you have to create just that, uh, what you also reveal to so many of the rest of us is that it's possible. It's just, it's, and that's, I think that's almost the block that so many of us have to, to get through our minds is that you actually can have that life. It can be arranged that way. Uh, and it's an intentional process uh, of both uncovering who you truly are, what you were really meant to do, and then how you put the steps in place to, to go about actually realizing it. And so maybe Richard, to, to sum up, what would you say is your meaningful way? My meaningful way is that my actions every day are in alignment with my purpose Mm. that, and I accomplish that, as I said, in in different vehicles, via my psychology work, via my podcast, uh, the nonprofit I'm starting for kids Mm. and and through my show's movement where I'm trying to get a million people each and every day to commit acts of kindness and post it on their social media feeds using the hashtag my daily helping. So when I, from when I start my day to when I end it, I know that everything I've done has been in alignment with who I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. Outstanding. Richard, I want to thank you so much for coming on The Meaningful Way, sharing your story, your insights, uh, your personal insights, the insights you've gotten from your guests as well, uh, and for everything that you've shared with the audience today. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And for everybody out there, I want to encourage you guys to check out The Daily Helping. Go to you know whatever uh, app you're using to listen to this podcast. Search for The Daily Helping. Pull it up and, and check it out. Check out Dr. Richard Schuster uh, on that show. And I guess the thing that I would just love to leave you guys with today, because it came up throughout the course of our conversation, is around alignment. How is it that you check in with yourself and really tune in to what are you meant to do? Is it the experience you're having right now? Is this the experience that you want to have for the rest of your life? If it isn't, then what are the changes that you're going to dive into? How is it you're going to begin to uncover who you really are? What are you really good at? What is it that you can connect to? How does that align around your values so that you can begin to live the life and have the experience that you really desire to have? So with that, as always, I thank you so much for checking out this episode and this show. And until next time, continue to enjoy the journey. Thanks for tuning in to The Meaningful Way. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor and please subscribe and follow along with all these great guests, their stories and interviews. Also, it helps us a lot if you not only share some of your favorite episodes online, but also provide us feedback. Go into iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast app happens to be and rate the show. Provide us some feedback and let us know how it is that we're doing. 
If you want to learn more about what we're up to, whether it be with the IPEC Coach Training School, the Live, Lead, Play Network, or even just what's evolving with The Meaningful Way, go on and head on over to LukeIorio.com. Thank you.